Hi, I'm John the Engineer Turmel, and tonight I'm going to participate in a saddleback debate between Barack Obama and John McCain, their first debate. There's a chance there's going to be a North American Union, and if ever there were, I'd be running for President or Prime Minister of that union. So I may as well take this opportunity to explain what I could do for not only Canada, but the United States and the world as well. So I'm going to be throwing in my answers and one-liners to these uh, arguments made by the other candidates, and I hope you appreciate the errors they're making and the ways they could be fixed. Okay, this one's dear to my heart. Uh, most people don't know that there are 148 million orphans in the world. And I want to give each and every one of those 148 million orphans interest-free credit cards at the Unilet Time Bank, which they can repay when they're at... 148 million kids growing up without mommies and dads. They don't need to be in an orphanage. They need to be in families. But a lot of families can't afford to take these kids in. Bingo, the problem. If the kids had their own credit cards, there would be no problem. Even if the family had their own interest-free credit cards at the government bank, there'd be no problem. Would you be willing to consider and even commit to doing some kind of emergency plan for orphans? So how much would it cost for 148 million pieces of plastic for each and every one of them? Like President Bush did with AIDS, almost a president's emergency plan for orphans. You don't need an emergency plan for orphans when you got John the Engineer's emergency financial plan for everybody, including orphans. Deal with this issue. I, I, I cheated a little bit. I actually looked at this idea uh, uh, ahead of time, I, yeah. I, and I think it is a, I think it's a great idea. I yeah. think it's something that we should, uh, we should sit down and, and figure out, mm -hmm. uh, working between non-governmental organizations. Mm -hmm international institutions, mm -hmm. the U.S. government, try to figure out what can we do. Luckily, I have already figured it out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that part of our plan, though, has to be how do we prevent more orphans uh, in the first place. And that means that we're helping to build the public health infrastructure around Sounds great, but you don't have enough money. ...around the world, that we are... Uh, you know, building on the great work that you and, by the way, this president has done when it comes to AIDS funding uh, around the world. I think you know, I'm often a, a, a critic of, of President Bush, but I think the PEPFAR program has saved lives and has done very good work. Uh, and he deserves enormous credit for that. Oh, it saved lives, maybe 12. The point is, it isn't optimal. There is an optimal. With enough money, it could be done properly. Most of these, they, they don't need to grow up in, in, in um, orphanages. They need to be in families. And many of those families could take them in if they had some kind of assistance. Well, I think we have to make adoption a lot easier in this country. That's Okay, John's in favor of making things better. Me too. Why so many people go to other countries to get to be able to adopt children. My great hero and role model, Teddy Roosevelt, was the first modern American president to talk about adoption and how important it was. And I promise you, this is my last story. 17, <laughs> 17 years ago, Cindy was in, in Dhaka, Bangladesh. She went to Mother Teresa's orphanage. Hmm. The nuns brought her two little babies who were not going to live. Uh, Cindy came home. I met her at the airplane. She uh, showed me this five-week-old baby and said, meet your new daughter. She's 17, and our <laughs> life is blessed. And that's what adoption is all about. <laughs> wow. He could afford to save one. I want to create a central bank that can afford... Um, religious persecution. What do you think the U.S. should do to end religious persecution, for instance, in China, in Iraq, and in many of our supposed allies? I'm not just talking about persecution of Christianity, but there's religious persecution around the world that persecutes millions of people. Well, I think the, the first thing we have to do is to bear witness and speak out mm -hmm. uh, and not pretend that it's not taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our, our relationship with China, for example, is a very 
complicated one. Uh, you know, we're trading partners. Unfortunately, they are now lenders. It was far more acceptable when they were lenders to the Chinese and they were collecting the interest instead of paying it. To us because uh, we haven't been taking care of our economy the way we need to be. Um, I don't think any of us uh, want to see uh, military conflict with China. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to manage this relationship and move them into the world community as a full partner. But we can't purchase that by ignoring the very real prosecutions and persecutions that are taking place. Uh, and so having an administration that's speaking out, joining uh, in international forums where we can point out human rights abuses and uh, the, the absence of religious freedom, uh, that I think is absolutely critical. Over time, what we are doing is setting up new norms and uh, a, a, a creating a universal principle that People's faith and people's beliefs have to be protected. And as you said, it's not just Christians. Yeah. And we've got to make sure, you know, one thing that I think is very important for us to do on all these issues is to lead by example. I mean, that's why I think it's so important for us to have religious tolerance here in the United States. That's why it's so important for us uh, when, when we are criticizing other countries about rule of law yeah. to make sure that we're abiding by rule of law and habeas corpus, and we're not engaging in torture, uh, because that gives us a moral standing to talk about these other issues. Okay, uh, another... The President of the United States has greatest asset is the bully pulpit. Mm -hmm. The President of the United States, and I go back again to Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. he went to the Berlin Wall and said, take down this wall, mm -hmm. called him an evil empire. After hearing the bright, erudite, young law professor's explanation, I'm shocked at the dull, boring, old man's fixation on making war on the evil empire. Many said, don't, don't antagonize the Russians. Or don't, don't cause a, a confrontation with the Soviet Union. Sure looks like he wants to antagonize them. He, he stood for what he believed and he said what he believed and he said that to those people who were then captive nations. The day will come when you will know freedom and democracy and the fundamental rights of man. He must have sounded like such a hypocrite to the people who suffered throughout all of Latin America at the hands of death squads trained by Americans. Imagine what he must have sounded like to people who'd suffered under those kind of conditions. You, our Judeo-Christian principles dictate that we do what we can to help people who are oppressed throughout the world. And must he sound like a hypocrite to the rest of the world now? And I'd like to tell you that I still think that even in the worst places in the world today, in the darkest corners, little countries like Belarus. Hey, why don't you go look at some of the dictatorships that you help closer to home? These, they still harbor this hope and dream someday to be like us and have freedom and democracy. And we have our flaws and we have our failings and we talk about them all the time and we should. Your little ones maybe, not your big ones. But we remain, my friends, the most unusual experiment in history. And I'm privileged to spend every day of my life in it. I know what it's like to be without it.